In today's show, we're examining how art reverberates across generations. Plant a whole forest if you need to, and maybe you'll eventually like one of the creations you make. It's a real love letter to Asian moms everywhere. I think nature is the inspiration for much of what we do and like how we create. Hello and welcome to CBC Arts Exhibitionists, the show that immerses you in the beauty and brilliance of the Canadian arts world. I'm your host, Amanda Paris. Today's culture is obsessed with getting things instantly. Instant news, instant music, Instagram. But today we're gonna slow it down, take a breath, and meet artists who have been inspired to consider their work across generations. Artist Jade Dart began working with his son at the ripe old age of two. The collaboration expands a fantastical world that Jay created using his alter ego, Jigs. The world is called Yonder and is filled with bearded men, giant women, and really tall trees. Now my only question is, does the two-year-old also have an alter ego? My name is Jay Dart, and I'm a drawist. The ideas for my drawings, they come from Jiggs, who is my alter ego. He tells me about this place called Yonder, which is a very strange place. He tells me about what he finds there, the people he meets there. I just try and take notes for drawings later on. I think Jiggs is, uh, he's just present. It's not really my choice when, when I hear him. It's just that voice that you can tune into when you tune everything else out. I started to get these items from him. Jiggs brought me this Geistwood log. He also brought me different variations of magical mystery beards, each one with its own power. He also brought me a highly detailed twig library and a collection of Geist saps. The trees are representative of how an idea comes to be. Each ring is, is, is sort of the stage of an idea. Any creation, there's an evolution of how you feel about that particular idea, uh, whether it's um, excitement, frustration, loneliness, and then eventually uh, the idea has to come to a completion. And sometimes following completion, there's a bit of a depression as to like, oh, that just wasn't what I wanted it to be, but then you reach the end and just the acceptance stage of, uh, of the creative process. And it, it is what it is. And then you move on to the next one. You just plant a whole forest if you need to, and maybe you'll eventually like one of the creations you make. There's a number of characters in the world of Yonder. Um, some of them are major characters, like the four dads who hover above this world. They're kind of representative of the cloud, where ideas are stored these days. There's this whole other cast of characters, which I generally call fellers, kind of the people who help Jigs along the way. There's also the four moms. They're giants in this world, major characters that, that Jigs is interacting with. They're sort of the gatekeepers to places that are, are far and away. As Jiggs goes further over yonder, he ends up finding a portal, which is basically a doorway to this other part of the world that became known as Beyonder. But that door literally opened when I started working with my son uh, at the time he was two years old. Scribbling is kind of its own art form. Nobody can scribble like a two-year-old. So watching him do his thing and figuring out how to do it like him, how to 
get back to that original mark making. It's kind of limitless. It's a limitless place where once you start making your mark, you can literally take flight. I wanted Yonder to be uh, a place that's representative of my imagination. Um, you got a blank sheet of paper, anything could happen on that page. In 2015, generations of priceless artworks in Mosul, Iraq, were destroyed by ISIS. This tragedy inspired a worldwide movement to preserve artworks by creating three-dimensional scans that could then be accessed by anyone with an internet connection. It's a fascinating moment in history, and our exhibitionist in residence this week is interested in how this process is transforming the way that we experience art. I'll let Pierre tell you more. Hi. My name is Pierre Chaumont, and I'm a conceptual artist from Montreal. I'll be this week's Exhibitionist in Residence. I'll present you gifts taken from my series Mosul, in which I use 3D archiving to question the link between art, power, and creation of knowledge. I hope you enjoy. Coming up, we are sneaking you into a place that would be a dream world for anyone obsessed with fabric or design or craft or fairy tales. Welcome back. Unto every generation, a prima ballerina is born. One dancer in all the land, a chosen one. Tennant, Kane, Ogden, they've all performed in the coveted role of Princess Aurora in The Sleeping Beauty, and they all rely on one central person, the wardrobe supervisor. The National Ballet of Canada premiered The Sleeping Beauty in 1972, and the same costumes have been worn by generations of top ballet dancers since. Each time the show is remounted, the wardrobe department is tasked with refurbishing all 340 costumes. Here's Marjorie Fielding, the keeper of these legendary garments. I love older costumes because they have a life of their own in a lot of ways. They, they carry the history of the dancers who've been in them. Sometimes it's just in the labels in the back that you can see who's worn these costumes. But sometimes it's a feeling that you can't necessarily put into words, that you just know that all these people have worn these costumes and danced their best when it was their turn to do the role. I'm Marjorie Fielding, and I'm the wardrobe supervisor for the National Ballet of Canada. We're here in the wardrobe right now at the National Ballet, and we're working on Sleeping Beauty, which is going to be on stage soon. All of these costumes were originally built in 1972 and they've been used since 1972, but they are maintained constantly because you want them to always look fresh. You want the audience to always be overwhelmed by their beauty. Costumes for Sleeping Beauty are some of the most elaborate costumes we have because it's supposed to be a court scene. Is that fabulous or what? <laughs> a 
fabrics go in and out of fashion, as do colors. So when you're looking to rebuild something that's been around for a while, we do our absolute best to get a fabric that that looks the same because it's our responsibility to the designer to make sure that the design remains what he or she intended it to be. This is a padded applique and the fabric is split here a little bit and it's been mended and it will have to be mended again. This is our fabric storage room. Here, all the sparkly things, that's Sleeping Beauty, and that's fabric that was bought in 1972 and has been stored all this time and used when we needed it. Because it's hugely, hugely frustrating if you can't find the right fabric. So this is a costume that was worn by Karen Kane in Sleeping Beauty. And these are the names of the current people who are wearing this. There's a, there's a mystical component to wearing the costume of a dancer you admire. that there are 203 costumes used in every single performance of The Sleeping Beauty. I can't even imagine that dry cleaning bill. Now, even though many of us have spent countless hours with our parents, we don't always know how they became the people that they are. This next artist had the opportunity to do a deep dive into one pivotal moment of his father's life. Aaron Munson traveled up north to freeze frame on one transformative year when his father lived in the Arctic. Aaron immersed himself into his dad's state of mind. And then, of course, he turned that experience into art. Take a look. My name is Aaron Munson, and uh, I'm a filmmaker and a multimedia artist, and about to put on an exhibition called Isaacson that's based on a, an experience my father had at an Arctic weather station in the mid 70s. Growing up, he, he continued to work for Environment Canada and traveled throughout the Arctic and all over Alberta as well as a, a weather inspector. The first thing that you see when you enter the gallery is a giant parka hood, which I'd always had the idea of like stepping into the mind of my father. Whenever you see like people with their parka hoods like up, you just kind of have this like, it's like this dark void that you're looking into, this little hole that they're experiencing the world out of. The project started out when I read my father's diary from when he was up in the Arctic at the age of 19 and found this uh, one entry uh, that apparently like quite depressed and was contemplating suicide and um, it was kind of a shock to, to read the diary entry and realize that that experience had been like quite traumatic for him. <laughs> That's actually me, like uh, I set up the camera in an old building looking out the window this is, was actually shot at 120 frames per second, so it kind of gives you a sense of like how fast the snow was actually moving. You'd just walk out and it would almost blow you right over. I think Isaacson changed my dad in, in a few ways. Like the voice that was in his diary before going up to Isaacson, like it just seemed like the voice after Isaacson was just different somehow, that the experience had kind of changed his perspective on, on life and kind of where he wanted to go with his life. This is one of my favorite images. Uh, it's, I think because it's just so chaotic and the patterns that are going on are just, like you can get a sense of how bad the weather was over the course of the winter and it 
created what I think is just this beautiful kind of this beautiful snow sculpture, and something that I like. How would you ever imagine something like that without seeing it in nature? So I think nature is the inspiration for much of what we do and like how we create. For me, Isaacson's kind of a backdrop to have a conversation about depression and people dealing with, with trauma in their own life. It's about presenting work that demonstrates that it's okay to be vulnerable. The station was decommissioned in 1978, so it had been sitting there for about 40 years abandoned. Even being up there for a week, you could really start to empathize with like what that experience was like when I went into the room that he was living in, and you just, you can, you can kind of absorb the experience in a different way. That was enough to really feel that kind of insanity set in when the wind is just won't let up and it's just this whistling force that's just slamming against the building like constantly and this would drive you insane like the, the sound of just it's so incessant it just gets kind of in your head and that combined with the darkness and just the physical isolation and the cold like it's just a perfect storm for a pretty traumatic experience. Isolation is something that can be felt um, much closer to home. Like, you don't have to go to the North Pole to, to feel isolated within your own life, within your own head. I think, like, the backdrop of Isaacson, it's a very beautiful backdrop to have that conversation about dealing with depression and isolation. Coming up, we're sitting down with actresses Cheng Pei Pei and Sandra Oh on the set of their new film, Meditation Park. This next story takes us to the West Coast. In a family, legacy is usually passed from a parent to a child. But in the film Meditation Park by Mina Shum, a mother's world is limited by a controlling husband. And it's through her daughter that she finds independence. We visited the set in Vancouver to meet the actors playing mother and daughter. Legendary Chinese actor and martial artist Cheng Pei Pei and Canadian actor Sandra Oh. Yeah. I'm assuming that's the CBC artist camera right there. No, he's just walking on the street. Yeah, he's just yeah. shooting. I'm like, okay. Yeah. He's very at home. <laughs> My name is Chen Pei Pei. I play Maria. And I play the character of Ava, Maria's daughter. Meditation Park is really about this awakening of independence yeah. in, in this woman, um, Maria. Yeah. I heard uh, Sandra that I would like to take the role. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. That's so nice. Are you kidding? Yeah. No, no. Really? I was watch that series. TV oh, series. oh, you saw the series? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Over again. <laughs> Don't be a hero. You're my person. How's it working with Mina now? Easy and smooth, you know, myself, Mina and the DP, uh, Peter Wonstorf, we've done all three films together, mm -hmm. and now I feel like it's been each generation. When you have like a 23 year, you know, relationship, it's really easy. I know, it, I know what she wants. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I, I will say, it was easier to make a film in 1994 than it is now. And I don't really understand why, because, you know, Mina Shum is a prolific and experienced and a wonderful filmmaker. And somehow, you know, the heart story, the personal story that she wants to tell, that we're all here to tell, is somehow in this day and age still difficult. It's very difficult that people would tell this kind of story mm -hmm. for older age women. 
but yet, you know, you get to spend like a whole 90 minutes mm -hmm. with Maria's inner life. And, yeah. and what I love about this script is, is that it's extremely subtle. This woman who can like kick your butt, can't, <laughs> doesn't know how to ride a bike. It's a courageous act to learn how to ride a bike. It's a real love letter to Asian moms everywhere. I think it's uh, everywhere I have this Maria. Maybe she'll wake up all the Maria. <laughs> That'd be nice. Let's wake up all the Marias. If there's an artist you think should be on CBC Arts Exhibitionists, let us know. Send us a message on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Our handle is at CBC Arts. I'll be back next time with even more artists from Peace River to West River. Until then, keep creating and innovating. But before I go, I'm gonna leave you with a time-lapse video by Calgary-based artist Heather Buchanan. We'll see her paint a young feminist icon for today's generation of girls, the badass telepath Eleven from the hit series Stranger Things. Peace.